Hello and welcome to Chicago Reacts, Americans Learn. My name is Colin, and today I'm watching Napoleon's Bloodiest Day, Borodino, 1812. Borodino, I'm pretty sure I said that right. That's a pretty simple word, Borodino, but knowing myself, anything is possible. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the last, it's been like a, a week, two weeks since the last time I actually recorded one of these. I was out for a little while. I started a new job and had to go train for it um, down in Florida. It's, it's remote jobs, but I had to go down there for a week. But um, yeah, so I mean, there's been kind of a trajectory of things not going super well for Napoleon. Uh, I think we were in Russia last time. And uh, yeah, not going too well. I think we're getting closer and closer to uh, perhaps the final uh failure uh for napoleon um so with that being said i mean i'm sure there's a lot more info to get into a lot more things to happen before napoleon's ultimate downfall so let's get right into it shall we and be sure to like share and subscribe if you haven't already and uh let's go as mario might say this Epic History TV video is brought to you by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. September 1812. Ten weeks had passed since Napoleon invaded Russia with more than half a million men. The French Emperor wanted a quick victory over the Russians, one that would force Emperor Alexander to make peace and agree to French terms. But at Vitebsk and then Smolensk, the outnumbered Russian army had narrowly escaped his clutches. The holy city of Smolensk had been virtually destroyed. Napoleon had advanced deep into Russia, and months of marching had left his army decimated by disease and exhaustion. It was now half its original strength, and summer was nearly over. But finally, 70 miles west of Moscow, near the village of Borodino, the Russians had turned to offer battle. Napoleon would have a chance to win the decisive victory that he believed would end the war. In 1812, Napoleon was master of Europe, but his meteoric rise to power had nearly been cut short several times by cannonballs, bullets, even by Madame Guillotine. His early years are brilliantly retold in the drama documentary Napoleon, available now on documentary streaming service Magellan TV generous sponsors of this video. Magellan TV offers access to more than 2,000 documentaries on history, science, space and true crime, available through your TV, computer, phone or tablet from as little as $5 a month. Might New have documentaries that out. are added weekly and many are available in glorious 4K. And if you visit MagellanTV.com slash Epic History TV, you can try out their service for a whole month for free. Magellan TV has dozens a of programs we'd happily free. recommend, from a history of aviation to World War II's Eastern Front. So if you're a history fan, we think this is a great offer. Thanks to Magellan TV for supporting the channel. I'm not sure if that's still in effect, the free month trial with that, but might be worth checking out. Let's see here. Soldiers! Here is the battle you have so long desired. Henceforth, victory depends on you. I, I, I'm curious as to, like, 
how accurate some of these quotes are, especially if it's in the midst of battle. Like, did he really say that? Or is that just something, you know, is, is I don't know, not, not necessarily advisors, but his uh, bibliographers, biographers um, may have added in there. Or maybe he said something similar to it, but they kind of fluffed up the language a little bit to make it seem more romanticized, I guess. I don't know. Because, I mean, given everything else that's going on, especially if it is taking place during a battle, like, there's got to be better things you could be doing than just writing down whatever the the commander-in-chief is saying, right? Uh, like, you know, making sure you don't get shot with cannon fire. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Oh, that was on the eve of battle. So maybe, maybe he did really say it. I Russian saw that. Army, commanded by the 67-year-old, one-eyed veteran, General Kutuzov, occupied a defensive position across the two main roads leading from Smolensk. Also, I'm wondering, like, what did they use for false eyeballs back in the day? Like this guy who has is missing an eye. Like, was it... It looks like he's got something in there as, like, a fake eye. It's just, like, painted white, but maybe they just did that for the painting? Because the only other reference I have is pretty much, like, Pirates of the Caribbean. The one guy that had the wooden eye he kept losing. I feel like wood would probably not be great inside of an eye socket, but what do I know? I'm not a doctor, so... If someone knows what they would do with four fake eyeballs back in the day, let me know in the comments below. Lensk to Moscow. General Barclay de Tolly's first army was on the right, its front protected by the Kalatsha River, steep banked but shallow and easily forded. Prince Bagration's second army was on the left, a more open position, but reinforced by major earthworks, the Great Redoubt, and what the French nicknamed for their shape, the flesh, the arrows. Another forward redoubt at Chevardino was expected to delay the enemy's advance. Historians still dispute the size of the Russian army, but it's likely Kutuzov had around 121,000 men and 680 guns at Borodino. On the 5th of September, Napoleon's army began to arrive from the west. Around 130,000 men and 585 guns. Napoleon quickly saw that the Chevardino redoubt would have to be taken before he could deploy his army and ordered an immediate assault. The attack was led by Compan's 5th Division of the 1st Corps, supported by the Polish 5th Corps to the south. In several hours of heavy fighting, the redoubt changed hands more than once. But late that evening, the Russians finally withdrew to their main line, and the redoubt fell to the French. Its capture had cost them an estimated 4,000 casualties, mm. while the Russians lost around 6,000 men. Napoleon noted how few prisoners were taken, a worrying sign of the enemy's unbroken resolve. Both sides spent the next day preparing for battle. Marshal Davout, commanding French First Corps and widely considered Napoleon's most able subordinate, appealed to the Emperor to use his corps to make a wide, outflanking attack to the south. But Napoleon dismissed the idea as too risky, and instead began preparing for a massive frontal assault on the Russian defences. Shortly after dawn on the 7th of September, Orthodox priests paraded one of Russia's holiest icons, Our Lady of Smolensk, before the Russian army. 
It was a stirring sight for many devout Russian soldiers, thousands of whom would not live to see dusk. The battle began at 6 a.m. as French batteries opened a deafening cannonade against the Russian defences. Eugène's 4th Corps advanced on Borodino village, lightly held by Jaegers of the Russian Imperial Guard. After clearing the village, his infantry crossed the Kalacha and advanced towards the Great Redoubt, but were driven back with heavy losses. The Russians burned the bridge across the river. Hang on a second now. Who, who's this group? Like kind of at the top. That's kind of like moving. Did they, have they, have I missed that? Did they mention who they were? Because otherwise like all this action's happening down here and they're just kind of like, maybe they're trying to get around, maybe? Hmm, I don't know, well, let's keep going. Maybe they'll, they'll do something. But did not launch a counterattack and Eugène was able to move cannon into the village to put flanking fire on the Great Redoubt. In the centre... Yeah, so like maybe they were just like... Reserves? Backup? I, know, I almost want to... If you don't mind, I'm going to go back just a couple... Of seconds. See if I, like, missed it. ...on Borodino village lightly held by Jaegers of the Russian Imperial Guard. After clearing the village, his infantry crossed the Kalacha and advanced towards the Great Redoubt, but were driven back with heavy losses. The okay. Russians burned the... And I'm sure it was explained in a, in a past video, but, um... Like, what the groups that are, like... Like, the one I was looking at at the top there, it's, like, half blue, half white. Uh, what? Ex who exactly do they represent? What? What? Uh, what group of soldiers? Uh, specifically, I guess infantry, cavalry. I don't know. Um, yeah, that does. That just seems kind of odd. That, that there's that one group that's kind of. I don't want to say avoiding the the action, but I'm sure they they were there. They had some purpose of being there, but. I just think it's kind of funny that, like, the video is showing this whole battle and then there's, like, one group up at the top kind of slowly sneaking by. I assume it's there because they have historical evidence that there was a group in that area at this time. But, like, what were they doing, man? Why aren't they participating? At least, I can't tell if they are in some way in this map, but... I don't know. Let's keep going. Bridge across the river, but did not launch a counterattack. And Eugène was able to move cannon into the village to put flanking fire on the Great Redoubt. Redoubt. In the centre, Davout's First Corps began its advance against the flesh, coming under heavy fire. While on the right, the Polish Fifth Corps, ordered to take Utitsa, got held up in the woods and ravines. Their slow advance allowed Tushkov's 3rd Corps to send a division north to reinforce the Flesh defences. Kutuzov, at his headquarters in Gorky, took little part in the battle, leaving tactical decisions to his subordinates. <laughs> Barclay and Bagration had spent most of the summer arguing furiously over strategy, but in the hour of crisis, they put their differences aside. They could see the main French attack was falling on the Russian centre and left. So Barclay ordered General Bagavut's 2nd Corps south to reinforce Bagration. Fighting around the flesh intensified as the French captured one of the earth... Sorry, that is a little bizarre to, to hear. <laughs> Fighting around the flesh. Anyway. I'm sure... Well, I'm not sure, but I wonder. I wonder if there were any comments or jokes about. I, I, well, is the word flesh, like you know, skin and whatnot, is it similar to how they say it in French or Russian? Anyone out there speak French or Russian? Know the answer to that one? Um, 
I guess there weren't any, yeah, there aren't any British soldiers here at, right now. But also now I'm wondering, like, I, I feel like I'm just going off on a, on a brain tangent now, but, like, so I know these are mainly, you know, French, Polish, Russian troops fighting right now, but, like, were there any, anyone from other countries, like, any individuals that felt like volunteering and joining along, just wanted to go to war, they had nothing better to do with their lives? Um, during this time period, maybe? Some English speakers? Because of that, yeah, the the flesh. Let's fight over the flesh. I, I'm not clever enough to think off my head any other kind of silly, uh, I don't want to say silly, but other clever uh, play of words with that. Anyhow, I feel like I've gone on too long of a tangent. Let's keep going. Works only to be driven out by a Russian counterattack. Davu himself was injured in the fighting as he fell from his dying horse, but he refused to leave the field. When Russian cavalry counterattacked, Marshal Murat himself led the French cavalry forward to meet them. Ney's Third Corps now joined the attack on the flesh. A charge by Russian cuirassiers forced Murat to take shelter in a square of Württemberg infantry. Murat, with his flamboyant dress and reckless courage, had now even made a name for himself among the Russians. The Cossacks, in particular, saw him as a kindred spirit and were eager to capture him alive if they could. To the south, Polish troops now took Utitsa which the Russians set ablaze before withdrawing. But General Bagavut's reinforcements arrived just in time to shore up the Russian flank. Around 10 a.m., Eugène launched another attack on the Great Redoubt. It was briefly captured by Morand's 1st Division, before his men were thrown out by a ferocious Russian counterattack. The Russian army's 27-year-old artillery commander, General Kutesov, was killed leading one of these counterattacks. A heroic death, but a blow to the organization of Russian artillery for the rest of the day. Fighting continued to rage around the flesh earthworks. Some counted as many as six major French assaults involving 45,000 troops, with hundreds of cannon on both sides, pouring fire into the packed ranks. I just, and this is another kind of random thought that just popped in my head looking at this painting here, but like... The artists who painted these, were they present for some of these battles? Like, were they survivors? Like, were they soldiers themselves and survived and they just happened to always be painters? Or did they, like... Were they hired to stand at a safe distance to observe and then be able to, like, paint it for posterity, you know, for future use? Or is it purely off of, like, uh, you know, they? I'm sure they the artists would have seen what the soldiers' uniforms looked like, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. They have many ways of studying the human form and, and all that, but... Um, so maybe it was just all described to them, you know, based off of the stories they were told from the survivors, I guess. Probably for the victors, yeah. But, I don't know. Just an interesting thought. If anyone knows, let me know in the comments. More than once, French infantry fought their way into one of the Russian positions, only to be driven out again at bayonet point. <clears throat> Junot's Westphalian Corps was sent forward in support, helping to clear Russian skirmishers from the woods to the south. General Bagration was close to the action, overseeing the defense of the flesh, leading forward reinforcements and ordering counterattacks. Around 10 a.m., he was hit in the leg by shell fragments. Mortally wounded, he was carried from the field. 
Shaken by the loss of their iconic commander, the exhausted Russian infantry began to fall back. The French finally took the flesh. Marshal Murat then led forward Friant's division, 1st Corps' last reserve, supported by waves of heavy cavalry on both flanks. So the French did take the flesh, and more than a pound. That, that was a dumb. That was a dumb one. I see. I was trying to be clever, and I, I I had like five minutes to think of something, and I just I squandered it. This is why I don't do stand up. But you didn't come here for my bad jokes. You were here for education. Here we go. <laughs> Russian grenadiers formed squares to ward off the French cuirassiers while their own guard cavalry fought the French in a giant, confused melee, with heavy losses on both sides. The Russians resisted doggedly, but the combined onslaught of French artillery, cavalry and infantry proved irresistible. As the Russians pulled back, Friant's infantry fought their way into the village of Simeonovskia. The Russian centre was in disarray, and seemed close to breaking. Surely now was the time for Napoleon to deliver the knockout blow. <laughs> Damn. Like... Did that work as like a rallying cry? Like, let's go and get... Kill! Let's die! <laughs> I guess it's just like the, uh, the French version of today is a good day to die. As Worf might say from Star Trek. <laughs> I guess, you know, I, I guess I could see it. If, if you're in the midst of battle and you're just like, I don't know, the hell, hell of it. You know, I'm probably going to die anyway. Let's give them hell kind of thing. Huh? Yeah, soldiers, face the enemy. Let's go and get killed. Like, I, I don't know, now that I'm saying it, like, repeating it, I'm like, yeah. But the logical brain is like, that's insane. That is a crazy thing to <laughs> kind of be cheering on, going gung-ho for. Interesting. Interesting how that works. Hmm. Let's keep going. For most of the day, Napoleon remained at his headquarters near Shevardino. Those around him later said that illness, as well as the exertions of the long campaign, had left him tired and irritable. As the Russian centre buckled, Murat and his staff urged him to send forward his last reserve, the Imperial Guard. The Emperor refused. If there is another battle tomorrow, he asked them, where is my army? But he did make one exception. Barclay was continuing to move troops from his unengaged right wing to bolster the centre. As Osterman Tolstoy's 4th Corps arrived behind the Russian centre, French observers feared they were massing for an attack. So Napoleon ordered forward General Sorbier's guard artillery his batteries opened a devastating fire on the enemy. Yet even as they were mown down in their ranks, the Russian infantry stood their ground. On the Russian right wing, all remained quiet, so General Platov, commander of the Don Cossacks, proposed that he lead an attack on the lightly defended Borodino village. Permission received, Generals Platov and Uvarov led a force of 8,000 Cossacks and cavalry across the Kalacha River. They fell on French and Italian troops around Borodino with complete surprise, spreading panic and disorder. Grouchy's 3rd Cavalry Corps had to be pulled back across the river to drive off the Russians. Russian commanders saw this raid as a missed opportunity but it had delayed the next French attack by two hours. Wait, was that the group? I'm I'm trying to figure out the best way to <laughs> indicate which little group I'm talking about. But the little the half white, half blue group up there. That was the group that I was talking about before. He suddenly got a little more involved. It looked like. 
Hang on a second. Yeah. It's the Kalacha River. So, coming over the river, over the top. They fell on French and Italian troops around Borodino okay, with complete so I guess... surprise, spreading panic and disorder. So I guess that group, the white and blue group up there, was like backup or reserves of some kind, maybe? Because, you know, they had to face off against the, uh, the Russian. Blah. God, I can't talk right now. The Russians that came in the, for the surprise attack. So. I guess now my question is who is leading that group there? Who is, who's responsible for them? I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too much into this. But uh, good to see them finally getting involved, though. You know? People are dying. Do your part. Grushi's 3rd Cavalry Corps had to be pulled back across the river to drive off the Russians. Russian commanders saw this raid as a missed opportunity, but it had delayed the next French attack by two hours, and may have persuaded Napoleon that he was right to hold back his reserve. Whoa, wounded for the 22nd time at, just at Borodino. Damn. Did he survive the whole thing? That'd be something. I hope so. I, I hope you're getting wounded 22 times. At least like, I don't know. Let the last one be quick or let him survive, you know? That's nuts, though. Around 3 p.m., the French launched their biggest assault yet on the Great Redoubt. Russian gunners targeted the French infantry advancing to their front, allowing French cavalry to outflank the Redoubt and charge it from the rear. Ah, wait, so I think they said the blue white guys were the cavalry, right? Okay, so I'm looking at the, uh, the signs there. Four corpse, three cav corpse. Would that be cav? I mean, there's an L when you spell cavalry, but is that is cav short for cavalry? Maybe. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna I would just assume that I'm incorrect. So let me know down in the the comments if, if I'm right or wrong. I'm assuming I'm wrong, but let me know. We'll keep going. French cavalry to outflank the redoubt and charge it from the rear. Saxon cavalry were first in, cutting down Russian infantry and gunners almost to the last man. It was an astonishing feat by the horsemen against all the rules of war and testament to the ferocity of the fighting. As Eugène's infantry consolidated their hold on the redoubt, he ordered forward all the available cavalry to exploit this success. But they were met and checked by the last Russian cavalry reserves. Eugène now implored Napoleon to commit the Imperial Guard. But again, the Emperor refused. I will not destroy my guard, he told his staff. I am 800 leagues from France and I will not risk my last reserve. By 5 p.m., both armies were in a state of utter exhaustion. The battlefield was strewn with dead and wounded. Some infantry battalions could muster only a third of their strength. Cavalry could advance no faster than a trot. Gun crews were collapsing with fatigue. As dusk approached, fighting slowly died out across the battlefield. Napoleon and the French army expected the fighting to resume the next day. But by dawn, Kutuzov, having learned the full, horrifying scale of Russian losses, had ordered a withdrawal. The losses on both sides were enormous. Russian casualties are estimated at 44,000. French losses around 30,000. 
Jesus. including 49 generals, 12 of them killed. Borodino would prove to be the bloodiest single day of the Napoleonic Wars. I feel like I've heard that a few times in this video series. Am I, am I like, imagining that? I feel like I've heard, or maybe in the past, it was the bloodiest days so far. But I thought there have been a few other battles that were claimed to be the bloodiest. And I'm just noticing, too, in the, the painting here, is that a horse missing a leg in the background there? My God. I mean, sorry, not to diminish the nearly 75,000 people that lost their lives, or casualties doesn't necessarily mean dead, but dead, wounded, and missing. Man. Right. I've, wa I've watched, you know, a few of these now, but... I don't know. I just I it, every time I, I I watch these and just learn about the casualty count or the death count, like it's just it it really is sad. Um, what humans have done to each other uh, throughout history. Uh, I won't dwell on that for too long, but. It's just something I can't not think about when learning about this stuff, you know? It's just sad. The Russian army could not fight another battle until it had received major reinforcements. And so Kutuzov decided that he must abandon Moscow. On the 15th of September, a week after his victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered the city. He would find it virtually deserted, and already the first fires starting to burn. Thank you to the artists Alexander Averyanov and Yegor Zaitsev for kind permission to use their artwork in this video. And thanks as always to all our Patreon supporters for making this series possible. Find out how you too can support the channel and get ad-free early access to new videos by visiting our Patreon page. Alrighty. That's that. So yeah, another very interesting video on the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Um, yeah, Borodino. I don't think I've, I don't think I'd ever heard of that uh, particular battle. And it was apparently the bloodiest. Uh, at least so far. Again, like I'm, I'm pretty sure in past videos I've heard them say that. So like, was this actually the bloodiest in the whole of the the uh, Napoleonic Wars, or was there another one? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just confusing myself. Again, it's been a few weeks since I've watched any of these videos, but uh, so I'm a little, little rusty. Not rusty, but it'll take a minute to uh, bring back some of the info that I previously learned um yeah thanks epic history tv i think i may have forgotten to mention that obviously this is where the video is coming from this whole napoleonic series if you've if you watched any of the other ones before this you know it's from epic history tv great channel good videos there i might have to let's see this came out three years ago i don't know if that deal they were talking about uh at the beginning there is still like an effect that like one year or it was not one year one month sorry didn't mean to press play again um anywho i'll go back and watch it but yeah good stuff so and next time the next one we're gonna watch is napoleon's retreat from moscow so that one's next so be sure to like share and subscribe if you want to make sure you get notified when that video comes out um and until then Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you all next time.